Five days from now, I'll be towing the start line in Big Fark, Montana in an attempt to obtain another one of these Spartan Ultra belt buckles. The Spartan Ultra Beast is a 50 kilometer obstacle course race that usually takes place in rough terrain. And I got one coming up in about five days in Big Fork, Montana. It'll be like May 2nd, May 1st is the day of the race. And I'm probably expecting about five to 8,000 feet of elevation gain and descent within that race. And basically you do two 15 and a half mile loops on this course. So as you come through the first loop, they have what's called a transition area where you can stow and leave some stuff. A lot of people call it a drop bin. You can leave a bin, a bag uh, with supplies, food, nutrition, gear, first aid, whatever you think you might need in order to go out and accomplish the second loop and finish the race and collect one of those cool belt buckle medals at the end. So in today's video, I want to go over what my drop bin gear looks like and how I set it up and configure it in order to minimize my time in the transition area so I can get back out on the course and finish. So as I go through this, I'll talk about what my logic is and why I do, it, do things a certain way. If I'm doing it completely wrong from how you see it, please let me know because I'd like to learn how to do it better if it's possible. All right, let's get to it. So the race starts at 6.15 a.m. for my uh, race group, which is the age group. Uh, before that, the elite start at 6 a.m. And then at, I think, probably 6.30, the, it's called the open group starts. So it's still going to be pretty early in the morning, and I'm expecting really cold temperatures. And who knows what the uh, weather will do throughout the day, especially spring in the Rocky Mountains. So one of the things I've learned about showing up and doing these races is show up and stay warm just prior to your start time. Don't worry about looking cool in your tank top and your and your running shorts because you're gonna freeze waiting. Um, I'm probably expecting temperatures anywhere from 40 to 42 degrees that morning. So one of the things I like to do is show up wearing long pants that I can easily take off and then a nice warm coat that comes off and a beanie and gloves. Underneath all that is my actual race, race clothing. I show up wearing basically an old pair of sweatpants that I could strip off real quickly, some gloves, a beanie, and this coat. The coat comes into play later uh, and I'll get into it while you might need that coat at the end of the race. So not knowing what the weather is going to be like, I am coming up with two different race outfits. One is a colder race outfit with lots of wind, rain, and cold temps, and one is a warmer race outfit. The warmer race outfit will basically be shorts, compression sleeves for my calves, and a light wind jacket. This is the Patagonia Houdini jacket. And if it's gonna be colder, Temperature wise and a lot more rain. I got a Solomon uh, jacket, which is definitely better at stopping Moisture and wind the Houdini jacket is great as a shell But if you're gonna get pounded with rain it serves no no rain uh, Purpose it's th that thing's in a it's gonna cling to you like a wet towel and uh, so but if a little bit of wind light misting it'll do the job so in the cold weather kit I'm gonna have long running tights right now the weather reports looking like I probably go with the warm running kit irregardless of which kit I'm wearing I'm going to go with uh, a craft base layer which is a long sleeve uh, performance top and I always wear these exo skin uh, toe socks they've never done me wrong as far as blisters or anything like that in obstacle course racing you need to have your hands functional because so many of the obstacles require you to grab, grip, and pull yourself over uh, different things, different implements. And so I have these things called blade mitts right here. They are totally awesome and they do a good job, especially in wake, wet conditions. You can uh, peel them off and get right into grabbing whatever you need to and go about your business to hopefully uh, complete the obstacle. Also, I've experienced this. I did a race in Tahoe when it was extremely cold. 
Uh, and so you can shove hand warmers down into the leg mitts uh, and kind of move them around as you approach a obstacle and keep your hands warm. As far as shoes go, uh, I'm not certain on which shoes I'll use. Uh, I'm kind of leaning towards the Ultra Lone Peaks on the left, but I may end up going with the Hoka Torrents. Either way, I'm going to maintain one pair of these shoes in my drop bin in the event that the train is super muddy or I need to switch up the traction or rocky or whatever, or I have a shoe failure. That way I can swap out my shoes, continue in the race and finish. So these are bleg mitts and they're actually made, I believe in Australia and they're named after a lady who does like these tough mudder races, Spartan races. I believe her last name is Bleg. And she ended up designing these things. And what they are is they're a neoprene. And you can neoprene mitten basically. So you can shove your hand in there like this, uh, tighten it up as a Velcro strap. You can have your fist in there, keeping it warm. And then as you approach a obstacle, you can just peel it back, shove your hand through, and you can use your hand to grip, grab, whatever. And as you get done with the obstacle, you pull it back on and you go about trying to keep the wind and maintain some body heat inside. Right here, if you can see, there is some drain holes. So if there's water in there, it'll drain out. Um, the left-handed side uh, mitten comes with a watch face. So you can basically put your watch through there and still see how many miles or whatever you've gone. Uh, these things are great. I've used them in a couple races where it's super cold. I actually used them in the Montana Beast a couple years ago and I needed them. Uh, I use them a lot in my training runs out here in the Pacific Northwest, which is extremely wet and rainy and you cannot wear gloves of any type if you're going for a long run because they'll just get soaked. And I find that these work really well in the uh, 40 degree to you know, obviously 40 degrees in the rain, 42 degrees, nice comfort level. If it starts to drop down below 40, I've used them in the Spartan race, Spartan Beast in Tahoe a couple years ago, which was extremely cold and windy. And what I did is I took some hand warmers and I was able to basically shove a hand warmer right in here and keep it there and slide them in and hold shove them down in so basically the hand warmers right here as you're basic as you're needing to grip or grab the hand warmers in here and then when you finish the obstacle you're able to pull the uh, hand warmer back up and cover and try to keep your hand warm when i was approaching water obstacles i take the hand warmer out i put it in a ziploc baggie and i'd store it in my hydration vest and uh, seemed to work pretty well um, i would not have wanted to be out there with just no gloves it would just would have been a miserable experience and uh so these come very highly recommended for me uh if you're in cold weather and moisture uh which you will be getting wet guaranteed if you're doing a spartan race so i like them so for the actual kit that i'll be wearing outside of my race clothes I'm going with a Solomon S-Lab vest. It's their lightest vest they have. And then I'll be packing it with uh, basically a nature's fig bar in the actual chest pocket of the vest. And then here in this craft belt, I'm gonna be carrying all my nutrition gels and whatnot. For the nutrition gels, I've used them in the vest before and I've done some uh, practice runs where I'm bear crawling and I'm jumping up on stuff and I'm jumping off of stuff and I found that the height, the uh, gel packs will come and they'll fly out of the uh, vest pockets which is no bueno in an obstacle course race. So my strategy is I'll wear the craft waist belt and I'll access the majority of my nutrition uh, in that belt uh, and I'll be using a Solomon speed bottle which goes with the vest and right next to it you'll see some powder and I use the hammer nutrition perpetuum is what it's called and it's a uh, it's a calorie source and so I'll be getting liquid calories along with my uh, 
fig bark cookies. And then also inside there, I have uh, my nutrition gels and whatnot. And I'll open that up and show that to you. Also, every Spartan Ultra requires that you have a headlamp uh, on your person when you're racing. Uh, and so I have, a, it's just a black diamond headlamp. I got the smallest one I can just as far as is keeping the weight down. I've used this thing a bunch in wet conditions. I haven't had a problem with it at all. Uh, and then in the old days, when you're racing competitively, you had to wear a wristband uh, to indicate that you were a competitive racer. That way you had to go do your, your burpees if you felt an obstacle and, and you would be counted to make sure you do all 30. Nowadays, you wear a red headband, but uh, purple is the color of the Ultra Beast. And so I have one from a previous race and I just use that. I use that wristband to protect my timing chip. The, rip, the timing chip goes on your wrist. I put a wristband over the top. I've seen it before in races where people will lose their timing chip and that would be an awful, awful feeling when you go to cross the finish line and, and you don't get credit for it because you lost your timing chip. So the timing chip goes on your wrist wristband goes over the timing chip and it protects it. I've never had a problem. And I also have a buff, a neck buff here, uh, which is going to serve two purposes in this race. One is, I believe Spartan's having a uh, face covering requirement at the start of the race, not when you're actually running or at the end of the race. If you're walking about the uh, venue, you should have your face covered. So I'll be using this neck buff as my face covering, but it also serves a uh, dual purpose. I can pull it up over my ears to keep my, my head warm and I can blow my nose, etc. Which brings me back to another point. After doing this for a while, for about five years now, I will never buy a coat that does not have a hood. It's critical to have a hood on your coat. It's just, man, just keeping your head warm, pulling that up over it can make a big difference on uh, making it a soft fest or making it bearable. Prior to the start of the race, you need to put some nutrition in you just, you know, 10, 15 minutes before the race. And I'm going to go with this uh, Mama Chia Squeeze. Uh, so I've used that before in training. Let me show you this craft belt and what I have inside of it. So this is a belt that I actually got from Spartan. I think I bought some gear. There you go. You see their logo. I bought some gear off of their uh, website and they threw in like this belt. So inside here, I have, I'm going with two types of nutrition. One is this Huma, which is another ch chia seed kind of thing in honor of uh, the ta Tahara Mara from Born to Run uh, and Goo. And so... I basically have half of uh, half of my calories are goo. The other other half is huma. I got these are 100 calorie packets. I got one, two, three, four, five, six. That's 600 calories right there. The fig bar that I showed you earlier is 200 calories total, and I'm thinking there's about 200 calories in my uh, perpetuum. So basically I'm gonna have about a thousand calories on my person when I start this race. Now remember, I consumed about a hundred calories right before the start of the race with my chia squeeze. And so I actually won't start consuming any of that fuel until I'm 30 minutes in the race. And then I'll be consuming fuel thir every 30 minutes. I'll be eating a packet or a fig bar or something. And then in between I'll be sipping on the perpetuum. So that's, they say you need about 240 calories per hour and that's going to extend me out into a five hour window. And I, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping I make it to the transition area before five hours. I'm really hoping it takes me about four hours, uh, maybe four and a half hours is probably what it's really going to do. And so one other piece of gear I forgot to show you here is I'll be wearing the uh, Garmin Phoenix five, uh, this is like the titanium model, so it's the lightest weight version. And what I do is I'll be setting my watch up, watch face to basically show me two things. One is time, one is distance. That's all I care about. I don't want to see anything else. I don't want to see my heart rate. I don't want to see my pace. I don't want to see my cadence. I'm not going to set any alerts uh, for heart rate, pace, any of that stuff. I'll have one alert. And it'll be every 30 minutes and that watch will buzz and vibrate. And when I look down, it's going to say eat. 
So it's a reminder to consuming fuels. So this thing is an eating contest, this type of race, especially right around mile 16 or 17. You better, you, you can dig yourself into a hole if you're running a marathon, whatever, you can gut check it out. But this thing's way more physical and tougher uh, than just running. You got burpees, you got horrible terrain. You might have just horrible weather conditions. You're picking things up. You're you're pulling your body up over objects. You're carrying heavy stuff. So you got to be eating all the time in addition to hydrating. Which reminds me one more thing I forgot to sh show you. I'll be bringing in this bottle right here. It says solids, but actually what's in there is the Hammer Nutrition electrolyte caps. And I'll be taking two of those every hour. So now we get to basically the transition part of the gear. That was all race kit. And as I enter the transition, I'm gonna have my second round of fuel prepped right here, which is basically a duplicate of what I discussed earlier. I have a couple extra energy gels because I figure I'll be moving much slower. Therefore, the second lap will take probably an hour longer. Also, some of these energy gels now contain uh, caffeine. So as I start to degrade, which I surely will, I'll be taking caffeine uh, to, to give me a boost. I'll have another Solomon Speed Bottle with the Hammer Nutrition Perpetuum already mixed in it on top. So one of the first things is I'll do is I'll strip out the old bottle and I'll put in the new bottle. I'll then start to add this stuff to my craft belt which will probably be empty uh, and once my vest is set then I'm going to go on and I'm going to consume a honey stinger and I'm going to drink this coconut water and I'm out I'm out back onto the race course hopefully that whole process I just talked about of basically adding new fuel to my race pack into my into my waist belt will take less than two minutes I want to drink that coconut water and eat that honey stinger thing in two minutes. I'm hoping to be in and out of that transition area in under five minutes. One of the things when I first started doing this, I'd go in there and I read all these blogs and uh, watch these videos and all this stuff. And people are talking about how they change your socks and put different stuff on and eat a PB and J sandwich. And what I learned is the longer you sit there, the harder it is to get going and just the longer day it's going to be. So just get in, do your business and get out and keep moving. Especially if you want to be com competitive, you can't stay in there. If you're looking to try to get a podium medal, you got to, you got to get in and get out. So super fast because it all counts. Uh, every, every minute counts, every second counts. So in the transition area, I have basically I'm going to have sunglasses in case it's bright out. I'm going to have a t-shirt in case I need to strip my long sleeve shirt off. I'm expecting the weather to warm up. I will always keep my Patagonia uh, or at this point if I'm going to do a, a short sleeve shirt, it's warm enough. I'm going to keep my Patagonia windbreaker with me. Now I, I, can, I can pack that down and fit it into the back pocket of this Solomon vest and bring it with me because you don't want to get cold up there. And one thing I've learned doing one thing I've learned doing this is the Spartan races, you'll be moving, you're warm, you don't have a problem, you'll be getting wet. But the second you slow down, you you say you gotta hike up a steep hill or you have to you get stuck in an obstacle. You're doing burpees, right? Uh, you're just standing there, you're not moving as much you're gonna get super cold and that's not a good experience. And I've seen several people get walked off the course. They're basically hypothermic and they're getting a fancy space blanket put around them and they're not having a good time. I've been to the edge several times uh, in that matter and I finished, uh, but I've learned a lot and I don't ever wanna go through that again. So wear clothes, don't worry about looking cool with your tank tops or your little tight running shorts. It's all about performance, not fashion. So if I need to, I can strip into my a t-shirt and I have here is a kit and I'm going to open this up and show you what this kit's all about. It has everything I need in it in case I get into trouble. And like I already said, I'm going to have one of two pairs of shoes uh, in that kit in the event that my shoes that I have on have failed me. 
So let me show you this kit and let you know what I got inside. So this is just a cheap uh, bag I bought. It says Gox. Cox, I don't know, on, on it. You can find it on uh, Amazon. It has an external pocket right here. And in this, I keep a pretty basic first aid kit. Uh, and I've seen a bunch of people bleed and get hurt. Uh, I've had all sorts of injuries doing these races. And in here, I keep some pre-cut strips of, I think this is K-tape or rock tape, uh, in case I need to bandage something up pretty quickly. This this stuff works pretty good. You get the Pro Edition because uh, it's somewhat waterproof. And inside you just have some generic uh, first aid kits, supplies. I keep some uh, some of this Pepto-Bismol tablets in there in case your stomach's going sideways on you. Uh, I also keep some duct tape. Uh, that could come in handy doing all sorts of things. Uh, so basic first aid kit. You don't want to have to go to the medical tent because you probably won't walk back out of it you'll probably be going to your car after that so i actually have the uh this is what is this sb saw i don't know what this is it's it's the k tip tape so uh i think i i think i'd use the other brands rock tape or whatever if they got a pro i'd, I'd recommend that because i know i've used that getting wet and it seems to hold up pretty well so inside this and like I said, I won't be accessing this pack uh, in case things have gone seriously wrong for me. So inside this pack, you have more pockets. You have more pockets. And so inside here, I keep basically foot glide, sunscreen, high quality sunscreen. This is 50 SPF. You can put this on your face. This is excellent stuff. Uh, and then I keep body glide. Now, prior to the race, this will be going on the, uh, the body portion and I'll be using this on my feet. I've never had a problem. Uh, I've had chafing problems in the past, but that was in like a 14 and a half hour event. And this event I'm hoping will only take me anywhere from seven to nine hours. Some tissue in case I'm crying tears of joy. And then on this side, I keep some spare hand warmers, uh, emergency poncho to throw over. You can even just use a black trash bag, giant trash bag, and people cut holes in it. That works to cut down the wind and rain. I have this gigantic uh, heat blanket thing, and this is more, I mean, this is like, I'm in bad shape, I'm rough. And I'm probably going to quit, but uh, I can throw this on and warm up. And I'm going to talk about that more at the end of the race. And then I keep a spare pair of shorts and a spare pair of socks. And I have seen people, actually these shorts I must have worn before in a race because you can see them torn out. I've seen people rip out their whole entire butt cheeks. And man, you know, you don't want to be the one running around with, with your butt hanging out on the course. So... So which brings me to the next portion is you finish the race and you're all pumped and the first thing you want to do is refuel. So I'm going to keep some refueling stuff there. And I also have a, a clean long sleeve shirt that's going to be fairly warm and a towel. And so when you finish one of these things in order to get your medal, get to get one of these cool belt buckles right here you have to basically go through the finish line and then you have to go to the results table and present i think you present your timing chip to them and you no know, they, they they cut your timing chip that's what it is but you go to the results table they have to confirm it you don't get the metal hung on you right when you finish you have to go check in they make sure you didn't cheat that kind of stuff and then you get your medal so i've done that before in other races where they're doing like a beast race and at anyways i've been there before i've had to stand in line and when you finish one of these things you, you man you become instantly cold i don't care what the temperature is outside you become like borderline hypothermic so what i've learned is 
worry about getting the medal later. Get yourself prepared to stand in line to go get the medal if there is a line. And so that brings me back to this point. When my race is finished, my pre-race clothing that kept me warm is there and available for me to put on. And that's why I have this towel here. If I'm soaking wet, I can try to dry myself off. I could strip off whatever shirt I'm wearing, put a dry shirt on and be comfortable. And if you're in really, really bad shape, if you're in really bad shape, you break out the survival heat blanket here so you can hang around and go catch your cool get your cool race medal and not look just totally miserable. So that's what I have for my race. And I'm gonna do a debrief on how it went, what went right, what went wrong, how my race went. So continue watching to the end of this video. All right, thanks guys. I forgot to add one thing. So what do you actually put your, your gear in? What do you put your supplies in? And so a lot of people will use a like a five gallon bucket with a lid. Uh, a lot of people, uh, I've seen people use all sorts of stuff. Anything that's going to keep it dry is excellent. Don't use brown paper bags from the grocery store. I wouldn't be using plastic grocery bags from the grocery store. Use something that's substantial against the elements. Uh, usually you can drop off your, your bin the day before. You're usually required to show up to the race venue the day before to collect your uh, bib number, check in and that kind of stuff. Cause it's such an early start the next morning. They don't have the volunteers there to do it. And it just, you get all your stuff. You want to do it that way. You can get all your stuff then and have it all lined out the night before. So you can wake up and there's less stress. So you're allowed to drop your bin off that night, or you can drop it off the morning up. Now my strategy would be to drop it off the day before. It's just one less thing to worry about. It's one less thing to mess up and you can pick a good spot, you know, remember where you put your bin, but I would put it at the exit lane of the transition area. So when you enter, you go right to the exit and then there's your bin and you see people leaving, which I think will probably motivate me to get moving fast too. I'm not over in some corner huddled up like a hurt baby crying, sucking my thumb, wishing I was at home. So get to the exit lane area and then put your bin there, remember where it's at, and that's one less thing for you to worry about uh, come race morning. So let's talk about what, I'll I'm gonna tell you what I use and what I've used in the past here. So, so I'm driving to Montana, so there's gonna be no problem for me to use this plastic tub, which is clear, which I like because I can look inside. And as you can see, I've added a bunch of silly stickers that I've gotten uh, from different companies uh, over the years and the reason I did that is it'll be just much easier for me to spot because you'll see a bunch of buckets or bins whatever you use it's kind of like the luggage carousel at the airport you know you want to put a bright pink ribbon tied around your piece of luggage so when it comes off you can distinguish it from all the other generic black pieces of luggage so that's one thing I've done here is I just put some stickers on it to get me to recognize it real easily. And if you can't do that, I mean, you can't bring this thing on an airplane and that's why some people bring buckets. You can, I guess you can put a bucket in an overhead bin or the real simple thing is just drive to a hardware store when you get land at your location and just buy a bucket. Uh, what I've done is if I'm flying, I use one of these uh, outdoor research uh, dry bags and I can stuff a bunch of stuff into it and then uh, it's great. Uh, so, and it's going to be protected in the elements and I pick a nice bright color, easy to spot. Other thing to think about is when you're doing this, put the items that you don't think you're going to need. It's they're your just in case items, layer them on the bottom of the bin and then stack the items you know you're going to use like your fuel, any hydration, anything along those lines and put that right on top so you can access it quickly. You're not digging through or anything like that. It's gonna save you some time, so. Ah, 
morning guys it's the day after the spartan montana ultra beast race out here in the big fork montana area and uh yeah, it was a tough one yesterday i'm really sore like muscular sore uh it had like almost 7700 feet of climbing and i think like 6700 feet of descent uh 32.4 miles according to my watch and uh, it took me 10 hours and four minutes I failed a total of four obstacles. Uh, I missed the spear once. I, I, the Olympus wall kicked my butt. I fell off that twice. I needed to do a bunch of work on improving my grip strength. And I got to figure out how to train for that. And then I, I fell off the multi-rig once and that was just a technical error. I, I messed up and grabbed the rope as opposed to swinging and grabbing the bar or the ring. I uh, kind of took the bait and uh, slipped off. So other than that, I did great. It was a super hard course. Uh, just you're just bushwhacking through, uh, you're bushwhacking through uh, brush. A lot of it wasn't trail, so I'd say it was like 50% trail running, 50% fail running. But a lot of it was just hiking up and descending. And man, it was really hard. It was hard. There was a lot of people suffering out there yesterday, uh, but we got lucky with the weather. So. In regards to the transition bin, uh, I learned some good stuff. I failed. There was a lot of fails in it. Uh, as far as my clothing went, it was great. I had clothing. I was able to make a last second option at at race at the start line, and I basically went with a I went with a tank top because it was so warm. I went with a tank top and like tights and and my warm weather kit, and I didn't bring gloves. It was it was perfect drank a lot of water yesterday and a lot of electrolytes and I never had any cramp. I had one cramping issue on the Z wall. I did see a lot of people out there cramping hard yesterday and that may just be because they weren't trained up for that type of terrain and they weren't hydrating or eating or uh, you know getting the right electrolytes in their system. So the, the transition kit it was great. I was in and out in probably seven and a half minutes. I'd have to look at my watch uh, but my fail was I had a speed bottle uh, ready with perpetuum already in there and it was a warm day yesterday it was probably 65 degrees and I come into my area the transition area and I had that clear bin which I thought was a great idea so you can look and see in well the problem is that thing is just it's just a cooker it's a cooker in the sun so I open up my transition bin and that bottle I mean it's probably it was probably 90 degrees in there and I, th I didn't think it was very I didn't want to risk drinking that because it's got protein in it uh, a little bit of protein. I didn't want to risk maybe getting food poisoning or something. So that was a ditch. That was a total fail. Um, I did, luckily, before I left, I put some ice water and ice in a uh, insulated steel bottle and I put some electrolyte tabs in there. So I had that as a backup, thank God, because at these Spartan races, there's no there was no water refill station at the, uh, at the transition area. So I would have been screwed. And I actually, I was able to borrow a little bit of water I got a bottle of water from a fellow racer, racer in there that I just chugged before I took off. Uh, so other than that, man, that transition stuff worked great. But going forward, I think it's smart to have an insulated, <clears throat> an insulated bottle with ice and whatever your fueling source pre-mix and then pour it into the actual empty hydration bottle. Uh, and then, I mean, that cold water was excellent. So I, I lucked out there. And then uh, also like compartmentalizing, I put my, my clothes that I kept to, to warm myself up. I put that in there while well, as I was digging through, looking for stuff, I had clothes everywhere. So going forward, I'll put the clothes in like a little uh, garment bag or a little packing cube just to keep things nicely organized. So uh, it was great going forward for the next ultra. I'm gonna be doing the Utah ultra Spartan Ultra, which is like mid-July. So what I learned, I, I did good running downhill and running the flats. And then pe so I, people would like pass me as they're climbing the hill and I would pass them. I'm a, I'm a better runner and they were a better climber. So what I need to do is I need to work on my uh, basically power hiking up hills. So we're gonna continue on this mission of basically trying to uh, just get a little bit better. Uh, try to finish these things a little bit faster so my wife doesn't have to wait as long. It's a long day out there. And it's a long day for me also. I was happy to get in the truck and uh, to get out, of, get out of there and get home or get back to the place we're staying. So, hey, if this is kind of interesting to you, I'm gonna do a video on our trip out here to Montana because we're also picking up a go fast camper for my truck, uh, which is a Chevy Colorado ZR2. 
And so that'll be getting installed uh, actually tomorrow afternoon. So if you want, I'm gonna put a link to that somewhere, uh, you know, as they point up in the sky here to watch that. And uh, if, you, if you're into the Spartan racing or trail running and wanna learn more about it, I'm not an expert, but uh, I, I learned by, I, I've learned, I'm self-taught. I've, I've, I've made a lot of snake mistakes. Uh, so a wise person learns from other people's mistakes. And if you can give me any suggestions or if you know how to do something better, please let me know. And so go ahead and subscribe and follow along and comment, ask questions, whatever. Okay, guys, I know this is a super long video and I kind of like to geek out on this kind of stuff. So uh, we'll, we'll just, uh, thanks, thanks for watching. We'll just put it that simple. Thanks for watching and taking the time and hopefully you learned something. All right, guys, thank you.